Now, one of the definitions of irony, as you'll see on the screen behind me, according to the new Oxford American Dictionary, is the following. Irony is a state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. Sometimes in life, things turn out the exact opposite way that we might expect. And sometimes, if you have a good sense of humor, it could be amusing. This is particularly evident, or this truth is particularly evident when pride is involved. That is, there tend to be unexpected consequences resulting from situations that feature someone taking a deep pleasure or satisfaction in their own selves, especially when it's at the cost of others. Now, this isn't an axiom. You've got to understand. Bad things don't always happen all of the time to people that are prideful. To the, it's, it, bad things don't always happen to people who have an excessively high view or, or confidence in themselves. No, that's, this is not an axiom. Sometimes we don't see the pride or the consequences of pride in our own lives and those around us. So, no, we're not laying out any axioms here. But pride at its root drives us away from God because it causes humans to misperceive themselves in order for us to properly recognize how much we need God in our lives. We cannot misperceive ourselves. We have to have a proper view of who we are as human beings in order to then have a proper view of who God is and how much we need Him in our lives. And also, before continuing, it's, it, it's, it's important to understand exactly what we're talking about when we say the word pride, right? The type of pride that we're talking about here this morning is not the type of pride in which someone properly recognizes his or her own dignity. That's not what we're talking about here, right? That is, we as people, we are made in the image of God, and each one of us has talents and gifts. There should be a deep satisfaction in recognizing God's empowering upon human beings to be good at certain things or to carry out certain tasks by His power and for His glory. We're not talking about that this morning. In, in this sense, we, are, we, we, we can, right? In the positive sense, we can and we should express pride in ourselves, in our children, in our spouses, in our mentors, in our mentees who are due honor and respect. When human beings act virtuously and in accordance with the gifts that God has given us, we act in such a way that is worthy of honor and respect. We bring positive attention, whether we're we're cognizant of this or not, we bring positive attention to the God that created us. And, And in this sense, we can say, yes, I'm proud of that achievement, or I'm proud of his or her achievement. Yes, we can say that. However, elevating one's satisfaction of his or her own achievements to the point where it is not charitable to other human beings, or we take credit for the achievements that we accomplish, complete credit for the achievements that we have com- accomplished that are re- results of gifts from God, right? If we, if we do such a thing and ignore God, this is extremely problematic according to the overall biblical witness. That's problematic. Using the gifts that God has given us to increase our worldly standing without recognizing Him is extremely foolish. Pride has the ability to be able to manipulate the faculties of otherwise intelligent human beings to the point of extreme foolishness, extreme irrationality. And so during this study together, we're going to observe how Haman Haman is depicted as an example, maybe even the paragon of which pride, in which pride or by which pride leads to utter foolishness and ultimately to personal demise. Haman's narrative continues to provide a paradigm for us today, for modern readers of the book of Esther, of how disruptive pride can be to one's flourishing. And frequently, though not uniform, unanticipated consequences of exalting oneself. Now, as we talked about last week, God is not overtly present in the book of Esther. Neither is his name nor title mentioned explicitly in the book of Esther. 
However, there is certain language, there's certain rhetoric, as we talked about last week, or gaps, we could say, in the story that suggest that the author of Esther may have been alluding to some sort of agency behind the actual events of the narrative. For example, in the passage that we read today, Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, we encounter the king, for some reason, not being able to sleep. Unstated reasons. There's a gap in the text. Why can't he sleep? In fact, out of all of the nights, these, uh, out of all the nights that the, the writer or the narrator could have narrated, why is he narrating about this night? The Hebrew of this phrase that, you know, the, 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 that where many of your English translations will say that the, that the king was unable to sleep actually is quite interesting. It technically reads, the king's sleep wandered, right? Now, what's interesting is that sleep doesn't wander. Sleep doesn't wander. So the king, who, again, remember from last week, he's depicted as the most powerful person, 127 promises. This is the kingdom of Assyria, right? This powerful king who reigns over all of these provinces and gathers, as we read last week, I don't think this is a good thing, gathers all these women into his household. He can't even manage his own sleep schedule. And the simple fact that his sleep wanders, his sleep fled from him, that attests to the fact that there is an unmentioned agency behind everything controlling the narrative. This wasn't the king that couldn't sleep, as some of our English translations would say, but rather his sleep for some reason wandered. He wasn't able to sleep because there was an outside agency causing his sleep to wander. The God of the universe was behind his sleeplessness. The God of the universe, whose universal dominion, authority, and sovereignty eclipses the earthly kingdom of Ahasuerus, causes the sleep of the king to wander. And here we see another side, a sign of the king not being nearly as powerful as the king might think. Also, notice that verse 1. If you just redirect your attention again to chapter 6, verse 1. Verse 1 indicates that the books were read to the king, right? Right? Read. They were read to the king. So the king is not active here. It's not like a king is reading the books. The books are read. He's, he didn't take the initiative to read the books. He doesn't find out the following information for himself or by himself. The lectors of the king's court are the ones who brought the very important subsequent information to the king's attention. What was that information? The information that was important was that Mordecai had never been rewarded for his loyalty to the king. Mordecai, who revealed a plot to assassinate the king, never, was never rewarded for what he did. The king, who is depicted as having all of this earthly power throughout the narrative, he's quite unassertive in this situation. He doesn't even read the books himself. Now, this powerful king, King Ahasuerus, is not only devoid of the capacity to control his own sleep cycle, but he was also completely unaware that on this sleepless night, this sleepless night would literally change the course of human history. And we talked about that when we, when we did our panorama last week. But this is where it all starts. This is the hinge here of the, the, of the salvation of the Jewish people. It can be argued that chapter 6, verse 1, just the very beginning of the section that we read today, is the crux of the entire book, and that this one sleepless night would ultimately lead to the preservation of the Jewish people through whom Messiah Jesus would enter into this world and thereby the salvation of all who would put faith in him. It's this night, this one night, changes everything. But again, This powerful king knows none of this as the annals are read before him. We read in chapter 2, or um, chapter 6, verse 2. Look at chapter 6, verse 2. It was found written. Passive, right? Again, it was found. Not the king found. Not the scribes discovered. It was found written that Mordecai disclosed the assassination plot against the king. And so it was communicated with the king that nothing had been done to honor Mordecai for his faithfulness to the king in revealing this assassination plot, contrary to what would have been the culture of the ancient Persians. And this passive language that begins the story, this section of the story that we read, indicates that no one can take credit for what comes next. Only God can take credit. His name is not mentioned, his title is not mentioned, and the, the main characters seem to be somewhat passive. These verses foreshadow the following scenario. 
in which wicked Haman will strive to bring, bring glory and honor upon himself, right? Striving to be recognized for his position of power. It was, it was something that Haman had already done prior to this chapter, as we talked about last week. But Haman's pride, his exaltation of himself, drove him to the point of irrationality in which he wants to not just kill Mordecai for not bowing down to him, but kill all of the Jewish people. So this part of the story goes like this. It's like this. As Haman is on his way to petition the king permission to, Morde to murder Mordecai because he wouldn't bow down to him. Now notice, by, by the way, he's petitioning the king to murder Mordecai early. He already has a plan to kill all of the Jews, but now he wants to make, it, make an example out of Mor Mordecai, right? He goes to petition, and, and, and he's, he's pondering, it seems, what should be done to Mordecai. Now, there's lots of irony in the book of Esther, as we, we talked about last week. But, but the irony here is that we as readers perceive that the king is contemplating rewarding Mordecai. Got to get this. As we read the Bible, we have to recognize that the Bible was written to be read. So readers are feeding from what's happening here. Now, sometimes we get lost sort of in the historical context of a situation, but think, the writer is doing this to the reader. We are the readers. We know that the king, ironically, is contemplating rewarding Mordecai, Haman's enemy, for his loyalty. But Haman doesn't know this. And that's written for us. We're like, oh, wow, look what's happening here. Look how this is unfolding. Haman's desire to kill Mordecai before the appointed, appointed time is what's outlined in the section, last section of chapter 5. We didn't read that today, but that's what, this is what happens just before the section that we read. In chapter 5, verse 9, we read an occasion in which Mordecai, or Haman encounters Mordecai at the king's gate just after Esther's banquet. And after this, he summons, this is more, Haman summons all of his loved ones, including his wife, Zeresh, right? And he brags about, he brags to them. He has fabulous wealth. He has a large family. He has at least two, uh, ten, ten sons, okay? Which, which in the Bible, if you had lots of children, that was considered, generally speaking, a blessing because your name and your memory would be passed down throughout the generations. He has lots of children. He has a position of power within the kingdom, but all of these things meant nothing to him, as we read in chapter 5, ver verse 13. Haman says, yet all of this is worth nothing to me, so as one thing, right? So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. One thing. That is, all of these wonderful things that I have, money, a good job, a big, beautiful family, Right? None of these things can give me the type of pleasure or attention that I want based upon who I consider myself to be. I deserve more. Christian, does this sound familiar? Do we ever think that despite all the great things that we have done in life or that we even have in life, that we deserve more based upon our perception of ourselves? I mean, let's just consider once again the, 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 the amazing blessings that Haman actually had, right? A huge family with at least 10 sons, maybe even more daughters. He has tons of friends, right? He's popular. He had a great job in the kingdom. He has lots of influence and power. Family, a great job, friends, wealth. All of these things are absolute blessings understood in light of God's plan for human flourishing. But when humans use these blessings to bring attention to ourselves, or when humans begin to identify their value relative to what they possess, family, money, power, like Haman, we will never be satisfied, ever. We have all the blessings in the world, but there will always be something someone else out there that we aspire to be subject to us. This type of pride facilitates greed. It facilitates covetousness. An overwhelming desire to dominate in all spheres of life. 
Haman's desire for control based upon his perception of who he considered himself to be led him to heed the counsel of Zeresh, his wife, and build gallows in order to have Mordecai killed. How, reason, how unreasonable can you be? I have a picture of gallows in case you didn't know what a gallow was. It's not a, a word that we commonly use in our day and age. This is a replica. Uh, a rep, uh, this was rebuilt. I think that word is replicate. Re- replica. There we go. It's rebuilt. There was actually no violence carried out on these gallows. The gallows that he built were something like 75 feet high. Why the hyperbole here, right? Why is it such so exaggerated? It's completely unreasonable and irrational. Haman's hubris leads him to one of, really, the, one of the, if it weren't so sad, it would be hilariously ironic scenes of the entire Bible. All right, let's just think about this as literature for a second. We as the audience, as, as we go into chapter 6, we know that wicked Haman, we know what wicked Haman has done. He, he wants to murder a man simply because that man wouldn't bow down to him. And so in order to do this, he makes this ridiculously high gallows, 75 feet feet high, like seven stories high, in order to hang Mordecai on them. And the way that the narrative is told, Haman is dying from impatience to kill Mordecai. Like, like why couldn't he just wait to kill Mordecai in the day which, in which all the Jewish people of the kingdom were already going to be put to death? Why? And again, we see the haughtiness of Haman is retold, and we could even say beautifully retold, in such a way that readers can't help but to see how do Excuse me, how deranged Haman had become as a result of his pride. So Haman enters into the king's courtyard. And he enters into the king's courtyard to ask permission to kill, to kill Mordecai. And at the exact same time, notice how this is told, the exact same times, it couldn't be told any better, at the exact same time, the king's sleep wandered. And as a result of that, the king is considering what he should be doing to honor the enemy of Haman. Now, don't let anyone ever tell you that there isn't humor in the Bible. That's biblical humor. Don't let this story is told in such a way that it's it's intended to be amusing, right? This before there was television, there was the Bible, and this is extremely entertaining literature. We know. Things that they, we, we know things that the characters do not know, and we can perceive the tension and the potential conflict, and that's how we're supposed to read this. Haman receives permission to kill all of the Jews, and he builds gallows, especially for Mordecai, but at the same time, the king is planning to honor Mordecai. So there's a tension there now as we read. What's going to happen? But the dis- divinely inspired word of God, right, it's not ex- exclusively literature. That is, we see, this tr- we see truths of what happened historically being retold in such a way where we can appreciate the literary techniques, but this is not exclusively literature. We're seeing what's going on here. And through, but through these literary techniques of, or what actually happened here, but through these literary techniques of humor and irony, we're able to see, we're able to really observe as contemporary readers how God frequently handles situation of people that are prideful. Many times, though I repeat, this is not an axiom or a rule or a law, but many times God turns the plans of the prideful on their own head. And in this case, where God is not present, in quotation, air quotes, right? In this case, the writer depicts this principle through the circumstances in this narrative. And the humor humor and the irony continue. Look at at verse 6. Chapter 6, verse 6. So Haman came in, And the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Now notice this. And Haman said to himself, literally he spoke to his own heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? So he comes into this complex. The king sends for him and asks him, okay, if I wanted to honor someone, what would I do, right? And notice Haman says, some of your translations might actually say that. Haman says in his own heart, right? We are getting privileged information from our narrator. Our writer is telling us what's going on in the inside of his own heart. He thinks to himself, he encourages himself to hear what he wants to hear because he thinks that the king is actually going to honor him despite the fact that this is not a reality. Now notice the pattern of the prideful here. 
Haman imagines, imagines the reality based upon his own self-perception, right? that the king would honor him more than anyone else. This is who he perceives himself to be. And so he goes through and he, he makes a list of the things that would bring honor to himself, demonstrating his view of himself. He petitions a royal robe, a royal horse, a royal crown. And then, and then he said, oh, you know, someone should escort this person around, uh, a, around the city by a representative of the king in the most prominent areas of the city so people, so everybody might see him, right? Again, this, we're seeing Haman's perception of himself through this. And lastly, he petitions that a royal representative would shout the, his praises to the entire city. Haman literally wants all of the, every single person in the city to be overwhelmed by his presence. But in an unexpected twist of fate for him, maybe not for us, but for him, the king petitions that Haman do exactly, exactly what he recommended to honor his arch enemy, Mordecai the Jew. Haman's reality is exposed. Whereas he wanted to kill Mordecai, he's forced now to completely honor him. Whereas he is intent on murdering all of the Jews, Haman is forced to publicly recognize that the continuation of the mighty kingdom of Ahasuerus on the Persian throne, the very Persian king owns his kingdom or owes his kingdom to the loyalty of a Jewish person. Right on time, this reality is revealed to Haman, right? He returns home and we read in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, the following. Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai before you, whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. So Haman eventually meets his tragic fate when he finds, when, when Ahasuerus finds out about his wicked a plot to harm Queen Esther and her people. Uh, and event, as we spoke about last week, he's eventually either impaled or hung. The Hebrew's a little shaky there, but he meets a tragic fate. Now, take a step back and talk just about Esther and how we've been reading over the past couple of weeks this book and how this book communicates to us as modern readers. The book of Esther is told in a narrative format, which means that the events, are de- the events that are depicted in the book, his- though historical, are selectively told in a straightforward account of connected events, right? So what we have in the book of Esther is a straightforward, selective account of events that happen. And, and-, and as these are done in a, s- a selective way, not all of the details that-, that the storyteller, the narrator, could be telling us are told. Now, the reason why this is important, it's important to recognize that we're told selective stories in the Bible. This is very important because the stories that are told communicate what the inspired writer of the Scripture actually wants to get across to the readers. Though this is important for me to tell you this, right? And here's the thing. In biblical narrative, readers are rarely explicitly told directly by the writer or the author exactly or the the writer or the narrator, exactly what they should do. We're rarely told, no, but you, reader, should act like this or should do this, right? That's not how biblical narrative teaches us. In biblical narrative, we're not told what we should and shouldn't do. We're provided examples of how we shouldn't and shouldn't, should and shouldn't act. Haman's character is portrayed demonstrating a, a, a pattern of the plight of the prideful. Notice the pattern. Haman is put in a position of power and is blessed with many other things that the people of Israel, those who would have read this story, would have understood to be blessings. But he isn't satisfied because he perceives himself to be worth more. And this leads to a a, a state of extreme foolishness, extreme irrationality. The narrator shows readers Haman's pride inevitably leads to his downfall by ironically depicting that the person who Haman thought should be subject to him is actually the one that Haman ends up exalting, right? And then the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai were eventually used on him. Now, the book of Esther doesn't teach 
that God will invariably bring upon, like, embarrassment of, the sh- of prideful people. This is not a rule. I've said that three times. But it is safe to say that God hates human pride. Why? Because it is inherently egocentric. And as a result of that, it pulls us away from him. As a result of that, it strips God the glory, from, from glory. It has an effect on human beings by pulling us away from him and making ourselves the center of our universe, and it strips glory from him for the, as a result of the gifts that he has given us to glorify him. We take honor and joy for our, or, and pride for, for ourselves. And so as a result of that, we see that God uses this concept of reversal in which there's an abrupt change of fortune in someone's personal life in order to bring about a proper response to him, in order, in many cases, to bring proper glory to him. Now, there's one problem about using, with using Haman in relation to this discussion about what pride looks like. There's a big problem here. Maybe you're thinking about it. Haman is the perfect example of a prideful human being. He re- really is. But the problem is that everybody looks at Haman and knows that they shouldn't be like him. Everybody here looks at Haman's story and goes, I'm not like that. And of course you aren't. In fact, the things that, that, that are depicted like in this text that Haman did are so hyperbolic, right, that none of us could actually even be like Haman, like build a gallows, try to kill lots and lots of people. None of us could actually even today be like Haman. And there's no ex- direct example in the book of Hester of how to handle this situation in our day and age for people like Haman. So there's really a, a very difficult issue when we're talking about the pride of Haman because, to be frank, none of us are like Haman. But here's the issue with pride. Whereas other sins generally manifest themselves in very obvious ways, like Haman. Pride can be a perpetual sin, hidden in the recesses of our hearts without it being visibly manifested for a long, long period of time. But the effects of pride can and do frequently, subtly, change our behavior and even the trajectory of our lives little by little. Notice, we as readers in the book of Esther are able to see into Haman's heart. We are given privileged information by the narrator to know what's going on in his heart and how that affects his behavior. That same pattern is applicable in our day and age. No, it's our heart that affects our behavior. Our heart, what's in our heart, our perception of ourselves in our heart actually is what changes the trajectory of our lives little by little. I mean, have you ever thought that you should be honored more than you actually are? Have you ever thought that in the recesses of your heart like Haman? Have you ever expected that others would provide you with more respect than you actually receive, like you deserve more respect than you actually receive? This is how Haman felt. Again, we're not talking about being prideful as it relates to delighting in our contribution to to humankind flourishing. That's not what we're saying here. We're not talking about that. Rather, have you ever thought that maybe you should be more honored or recognized on your jobs, sports teams, in classrooms because maybe others are getting the honor or respect that you think you should be getting? That's how Haman felt. I mean, how many times have parents have we thought that our children should give us more honor and respect just because we're in front of other people, right? That might be how Haman felt. So as we read through this narrative, there's just, uh, featuring Haman, we see that there's this desire of of recognition that leads us to create imaginary, this desire for recognition leads us to create imaginary worlds in, in which we're the center We're the ones who should be recognized the most. But more often than not, when we set up this imaginary situation and we we presume admiration, we are disappointed when we don't get what we think we should deserve. And as we continue this cycle of refusing to humble ourselves, we can get to the point where we're willing to act out more and more in order to receive the accolades that we think we should be receiving. Like, Like, what do we do about this? Like, do we just do better? Well, all of us struggle with this. This is not me versus you. This is not you versus you, but this is all of us, right? Because 
Only, uh, only we know what is going on internally, like the narrator tells us about what's going on with Haman. Only we can perceive that. And so we should pray, right? When we feel a longing to be recognized and admired for something that we've done, we should just stop and pause and consider the condition of our hearts. Now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're always going to feel like you're doing something wrong. No, no, no. We just need to pause because praying helps us remember who we are in the eyes of the living God, right? Who we are before God. Prayer helps us realize that the only being that ever walked the face of the earth that is worthy of all the honor and recognition that we so frequently want is the Lord Jesus. He's the only one that's really worthy. And Jesus didn't even receive the glory and honor that was due to him. And if Jesus didn't receive the glory and honor that's due to him, then what makes us think that people should recognize us for all that we think that we're worth? Prayer redirects our attention to him and glorifies him, the only one who deserves to be recognized for all of the glory We should meditate on the Word of God because meditating on the Word of God reminds us that only God deserves glory. Jesus is our perfect example in the Word of God, right? When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert to bring credit to himself, credit rightfully due to himself, what did he do? He cited the Scriptures. Familiarity with the character of God as it is portrayed throughout the Scriptures is what Jesus shows us to help us stray from the sins of of pride, even when he was tempted. Now, I'm not simply saying that we should, we should not be prideful because if you're prideful, bad stuff's going to happen to you. No, that's not what we're saying. But let's be honest. In many cases, sometimes when we're prideful, we need to be humbled in very drastic ways. And so it's my prayer for us that as, as believers, as the body of Christ, that we would strive by simple imp- simply implementing those very simple reflection times of, of prayer and time in the Word, that we would strive not to ri- rob God of glory by bringing it upon ourselves because He has given us the gifts, we sh- the gifts to do great things. We cannot deny Him in the process. If we deny Christ by bringing glory to ourselves, if we deny giving Him the glory, then we rob him of the, glo- the very glory and honor that is exclusively due to him. Oh, oh, oh.